The Unshackled Waves, episode 114. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, great to have your company. One of the groups that has been terrorising Western nations this past year, apart from ISIS, was Antifa. They are a far-left street activist group who attempt to de-platform, harass, vilify, slander and ultimately violently attack those they disagree with. This is because they subscribe to such an extreme ideology that they view anyone that doesn't agree with them of perpetuating hate speech and oppression against various victim groups. It started in the United States and has been successful in shutting down a number of conservative events at university uh, campuses. It has been active in Australia and through its local affiliates has been counter-protesting at Patriot rallies and events where conservative politicians and public figures are speaking. It amazes most rational people uh, who how such groups can exist with such a warped view of the world and claim they are about tolerance and compassion when their actions demonstrate the exact opposite. One ex-Antifa member is now shedding light about the inner workings of the organisation, its worldview and the danger it poses. This is Shane Hunter. He was in the Australian organisation for four years. He now uses his YouTube channel to debunk the flawed logic and misinformation that is put out by Antifa, as well as doing other media and events to speak out against the organisation. We are lucky to have him on the show today to share his experience and help us understand how exactly Antifa justifies itself. Shane, welcome to the show. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Now, before we get into uh, your experience with Antifa, I wanted to uh, go back to the beginning of when you first uh, uh, engaged in uh, politics. What were your political views before you joined Antifa? Um, I was sort of a, a, I guess, American-style um, sort of uh, centre-right libertarian, and that I viewed that the, you know, the whole, the problem is the government, the government's wrong, and capitalism is wonderful, and that, um, yeah, that basically the, the the U.S. government was corrupted, they were kind of owned and operated by banks. And um, and that their foreign policy was uh, disastrous, and those two issues were my biggest concerns politically. And so, how did because obviously you didn't start out with uh, far left views. How did you come to uh, believe that uh, joining Antifa and being involved with the far left was the answer? Well, I started to attend uh, sort of rallies in Sydney um, and a few political events. I got sort of really. I started to become more and more active and actually act on my political views when the West was thinking about invading Syria and I think about 2012, um, right when the sort of Syrian civil war was kicking off. And um, I had massive concerns about that and so I started going to all these events and then I was hanging out in Sydney's inner West, um, which you know is near Sydney University and it's quite a progressive sort of town. Uh, suburb and uh, by osmosis I sort of started to hear more and more sort of left-wing ideas but then it wasn't until I started going to the Black Rose Anarchist bookshop and having conversations with them that I, I slowly sort of absorbed those politics. And, and so that obviously led you to becoming uh, involved in Antifa and being an organizer for it. How did that uh, process progress? Yeah so I, it was it was a slow process. Um, so I slowly went from sort of wearing my own dress or clothes um, for like six months hanging around these sort of uh, anarchists and then I slowly just started to wear all black to, <laughs> to show how individualist I was um, and because that's what everyone else was doing and I was sort of going to these um, rallies and uh, started to live in these squats and stuff um, and it was maybe about a year when I was in the anarchist subculture that a guy um, joined the scene who had been over from Europe and he was, uh, his whole thing was anti-fascism. And so he was sort of like agitating towards doing anti-fascist stuff. And, you know, at the time, a lot of the anarchists were kind of like, 
not that interested in the whole radical right thing. They were like, you know, they, they, they're such a minor, irrelevant thing that it, it doesn't seem useful. But this guy was, you know, certain that we, we had to go smash the fascists or whatever. And, um, and then there were sort of a few sort of actions around, um, I guess, Australia First Party. Um, and then it wasn't until the Reclaim Australia rallies kicked off that the sort of Antifa and the, and the radical left started to sort of get obsessed about the radical right. Now, obviously, it was a radical transformation for you politically. Uh, did you ever, uh, during uh, your time in the, the early days, have second thoughts uh, about Antifa that, you know, or maybe, you know, these guys are, you know, a bit too uh, radical? Did that ever enter your mind? Yeah, absolutely. I thought that it was... I, I did have concerns that it would just sort of degenerate into some sort of gang warfare um, and that, you know... It was the first time I saw myself being at risk of sort of physical violence as well. I had those concerns and I remember one of the radical leftists I was dating at the time, she had her reservations um, about the whole Antifa thing. But um, yeah, I, I did have those sort of dissenting ideas in my head. But then over time, I guess um, the narrative that you know, that the, the, the radical right was this impending threat that was going to take over Australia, sort of, I guess, won out in my mind. And then, you know, I started to perceive, I guess, the radical right being a bigger threat than they actually are. And then secondly, I also feel that when your politics is relating to so such abstract concepts as the patriarchy and capitalism and, and all these systems of control, right? Um, it's very hard to see any kind of progress in terms of how your activities are changing society because the goals are just unrealistic. And so I actually think that one of the reasons people get into the Antifa thing is because you get to see a tangible result. There's actually a... There are actual radical right-wingers that you can impact. And so I feel that gives you a sense that you're related to your goals. While a lot of the other politics and activism often is very abstract. Uh, uh, what you mean by that is that... Uh, you can see that you're, you know, intimidating and actually, in some cases, physically hurting these, you know, uh, right-wing activists. So is that what you mean by that? So when you get to, like, say, picket um, uh, a far right wing event and stop that from happening, that gives you a sense that you're doing something when, you know, handing out flyers or going to some rally or whatever, it's a less of a tangible result of, of your actions. And uh, I've heard you talk about this, that uh, Antifa and other uh, radical uh, groups, they, they tend to attract uh, people who are looking for meaning in life and don't have uh, much else uh, going on in, in their lives. Can you explain a bit further about uh, how that uh, process or how, how it worked for you? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think, um, I mean, I think I did have meaning in my life. Um, so, you know, I had a sort of promising career as a stand-up comedian and um, it was sort of at the point in my career where I needed to kind of jump up to the next playing field and start doing like the, the comedy festivals. And I wasn't conscious, this, conscious of this at the time, but, you know, a lot of people are often afraid of success because the more successful you get, the more responsibility you have to have. Um, and... You know, in my mind at the time, I was like, oh, well, what if nuclear war happens because of Syria? What about all the deaths in the Middle East? I mean, these things seem so much more important than my little life and my career. But that was, I think often when we do things, we pick, our, we choose the, the narrative for our motivation as being the most noble narrative. While in reality, there could be other motivations that we're less conscious of. And I wondered to what degree was getting involved in this radical politics a way of avoiding um, the the burden of responsibility of uh, of sort of running my own life and my own career. And so as you kind of get further and further into this political realm, 
it seems like the other aspects of your personality and identity get um, further and further behind until, you know, th this, this activism and stuff takes over your whole identity. And then once that happens, it's, it's very hard to get out of and it's very hard to see beyond it as well. Now, Antifa is just one of the many far-left uh, groups we have in Australia. Obviously, there's the, the Socialist Alternative, and uh, down in Melbourne, we have the uh, campaign against uh, racism and fascism, which was responsible for a lot of the uh, protests we have down here. Now, Antifa, is it fair to classify them as having communist, uh, socialist, uh, philosophical ideas behind them? Yeah, that's uh, absolutely fair to categorise them as that. I mean, they they will often try to appeal to um, non-ideological people by hyping up the threat of the radical right. I mean, you know, obviously, I think the, there are some dangerous people in the radical right. I mean, there was that guy who was going to make a bomb and, and uh, you know, there's other kinds of things going on there but you know the, the state apparatus is going to stop that stuff it's not it's not going to be antifa but they they try and hype up these narratives in order to um to yeah try and sort of recruit people and yeah i think people can kind of get swept in that but by and large it's mostly um far left-wing ideologues like anarchists and communists and um and yeah they they i mean it's interesting um you know, I think I think at the time, if I was really honest with myself, the whole building the counter rallies and stuff like that, I mean, it's almost a great chance to recruit and to exert power and influence and kind of um, build strength for the radical left almost as much as it is about stopping the radical right. I had a, a sort of exchange with Slack Bastard and I queried him about the problematic nature of what happened at the Berkeley protest against Milo um, and where the university was burnt down and, and stuff like that and, and moderate right-wingers were even attacked. Um, and he sort of, I, I pointed out to him that this gave Milo more of a platform than the platform he was allegedly being deplatformed because all the media and the world's cameras were paying attention to the the writer scenes and wanted to know what all the fuss was about and he got interviews in tv stations all across the world okay so his platform like if i got a pr firm and i sat down and i tried to work out how to give milo the biggest platform possible i couldn't come up with a better idea than what antifa did in berkeley right i, I can't conceive of a better way to get get him more attention but he sort of ignored that point. And I also remember when I was in the whole Antifa thing, I remember like a non-ideological friend said to me, don't these protests just give more attention to the radical right? And I just got angry at him because usually when you can't answer something and you get angry, it's a sign you're wrong, right? Um, slack bastard sort of just went, oh, well, even if that's the case, it's good that it brings the left together. And, and I think a lot of the time that the radical left secretly want there to be a radical right movement that's big and strong because it, it validates their, their meaning and purpose. And it's also a great recruitment, um, a, a way for them to kind of hype up, oh, look, see, the fascists are coming. You need to join us. We're going to stop the fascists. But if if there was a violent radical right, right wing movement um, that was like physically putting people in danger, it's the state apparatus that's going to stop it, not a bunch of communists and anarchists. And they do sort of this uh, view of the West that it's, you know, based on a system of oppression and there's all these, you know, various victim groups. We've heard of the term uh, intersectionality, which is there's a hierarchy of oppressed groups. So it does also, uh, f apart, uh, f apart from, you know, all the, you know, violence and, you know, smashing fascists, they do, you know, subscribe to this, you know, identity politics, uh, politically uh, correct uh, cultural view. Yes, they do. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it, it's so bizarre at the time, you know, it's so, it's so bizarre because both the radical left and the radical right kind of put the group identity above the individual. 
you know, and I could see how the radical right were putting, you know, these kind of abstract notions of like whiteness or whatever. But then at the same time, I couldn't see how the radical left was replicating the same kind of logic and that group identity comes before individual merit or the individual. So I, I don't actually buy this narrative that the radical left are against racism and sexism. I think what they do is they go, they just replicate it in another way. So they become irrationally resentful of people in the oppressor group, right? So the people with privilege or whatever, which is the straight white male, um, regardless of that individual's circumstances or life, right? They just caricature them. And then they become sycophantic towards people they think are oppressed. So quite often in these radical spaces, um, you know, people would sort of, uh, yeah, sycophantically sort of agree with um, anything someone of, a, of an oppressed status would, would say or do and hold them to a much different standard. And, and I, I think that's a form of racism. And uh, I also think that I, I've got a good example of how this sort of plays out. So um, there was uh, like a, one of these radical left-wing events, right? And there was this guy who was a gay guy and for 10 years had been campaigning for the gay marriage thing, right? So in my experiences, this was one of the more authentic people on the radical left. I mean, they they followed through and they, they did a lot of activity while a lot of people just sit around and they sort of have the right beliefies but don't do anything. Anyway, so there was a party and um, someone had an epileptic fit and there was a disagreement between this individual and someone who identified as a trans indigenous woman who was blind, right? So they had like four special identity points, right? So they were the ultimate sacred being of the radical left, right? And instead of two adults having a disagreement over how, uh, pe how people should react in a medical situation, um, it turned into uh, that person was disagreeing with the, the trans blind uh, indigenous woman um, because he was a racist, sexist, transphobe, right? And they also have this thing of accusation equals verdict. Right, because to question an accusation of racism and sexism, whatever, would be helping the forces of racism and sexism, right? And so this person was banned from an anarchist social center, the Black Rose, right? And um, and so this person was gutted. This this activist was like quite hurt, and their reputation felt damaged. I mean, you have to keep in mind that this person's whole world is based in this subculture. And they wanted to respond to this accusation, and they weren't allowed to. Um, and this Black Rose organizing collective, whose job it was only to organize the uh, and facilitate the social center, had like five, three or five meetings over the alleged guilt of this person, right? Right up into the phase where the bookshop's lease was about to end, and their main job was to either renew the lease, get a lease in another venue and work out to do with all the property of the space. They left all that to the last day, but they yet and they didn't have any meetings and they didn't organize that. But yet they found the time to have these this bloody tribunal by a bunch of uh, dull bludging activists. Right. And so I wonder to what extent as well that the whole racism and sexism thing and, uh, and the way that that gets thrown down, thrown around is a way for them to exercise power. So if I say that you're victimizing me, you know, I would then have a moral justification to go after you and attack you, right? So I think underneath a lot of this is some pretty, pretty dark psychology. Uh, what the hell? And that, uh, that stemmed from a situation when all this guy was trying to do was, you know, help help this, you know, person who was who was having a fit, and yet, yet he gets uh, hauled before uh, this, you know, star chamber, which leads on to my, you know, next question. A lot of a lot of the talk uh, when we see, you know, the you know vi uh, violence and a lot of the aggression that comes from Antifa is, you know, if that's how they're behaving now, what would uh, a society run by them look like? Well, what is their, you know, perfect society? You know, how, how would they like to see, um, you know, Australia run, for example? 
Yeah, I mean, they're, they're sort of utopians, you know what I mean? And, um, I mean, I think the society that they would run would be a, would be a nightmare, you know, but just like the radical right right can um, has like a utopian vision of the ideal ethno state or whatever, um, they the radical left too lives in a fantasy world that's unachievable. So they believe that, um, you know, that, 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 you know, that the human, that we're all going to live in some sort of democratic, you know, <laughs> giant communes or whatever, and all eat breakfast together. And, um, man, it would be a nightmare. I mean, they kind of, what they do is they take a, a few, like, values and, and stuff, but they don't have, they have the wrong hierarchy of values. I mean, truth is way down the bottom there. And when you believe, you know, that moral trolley experiment where you pull the lever, there's, there's uh, two tracks and a train's coming. The, the train could run over four people tied to a track or you could pull the lever and, and kill one person on the track to save the four, right? Okay, when you have an ideology that will create abstractions of, of images of how the world is, um, you can then believe that um, by pulling that lever and hurting that one individual, you're, you're saving the many. And you can you can follow that process onward. So I reckon that they, they could justify mass murder pretty much based on that narrative. And um, you know even you know like I'm not necessarily down for racism and sexism, but I mean I think the way that they define it is 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 wrong. And then secondly, I think that you know by re by taking the mainstream value of being against racism and sexism, redefining it gives them a moral high ground that isn't earned. But then it also gives them a justification to bully someone. And then it's like the moral trolley experiment. It's like, okay, that person, that working class person said the word cunt. That means they hate women. That means they're a sexist. That means I'm justified in bullying them. And that means m me bullying them isn't bullying them. I'm helping usher in a new society because I'm fighting against the evil forces of sexism. You know, keep in, keep in mind we have the same brain as we had in the Stone Age or maybe even smaller. So, you know, it, it's like how ancient people believed in spirits. Like, they see the spirit of racism and sex. We've already talked about how uh, violence is uh, one of the, the main tactics uh, of Antifa, and it's not just reserved for, you know, uh, as you would term, you know, the radical right people they view as fascist. Uh, they also uh, protest at uh, political events where, you know, conservative uh, politicians are speaking. We only saw uh, just last month uh, Tony Abbott's uh, sister, uh, Christine Forster, attacked on her way onto uh, a liberal fundraiser. So they, they clearly uh, believe that, you know, all this, you know, violence is justified because they, they view their opponents as not they're, they're not simply people that they dis disagree with. It's They view them as evil and bigoted. And so any type of uh, violence uh, against them is, is justified and virtuous. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. It's the moral trolley experiment. So these conservatives, um, you know, a lot of these conservatives, like they, like, you know, uh, are, would be against you know, a lot of examples of, of racism and sexism in their, you know, mainstream traditional terms, not the crazy terminology of the neo-Marxist where, you know, a white person with dreadlocks is suddenly racist. You know, the, the, the radical left is actually, I mean, think about how many thousands of years did it take for being against racism and sexism to become a mainstream value in society? How, how, how many thousands of years did that take, right? And I feel that these people are eating that social fabric. They're cannibalizing it for instant gratification. And what I mean is like, so if a child, you know, cries and its mother constantly attends to it, it will learn that it can exert power over its mother through crying and whatever. So I think we too do that as adults. If I go, oh, that person's racist, that person's sexist, other people will turn around and pay attention, right? And so, in that sense, there's a there's a form of, of, of power that you can wield by by sort of using these terms. And just like any currency, the more you print it, the lower the value becomes. So they're overusing their overuse of terms like racist, sexist, and even defining moderate right wingers as fascists actually provide a perfect smokescreen for actual racists and sexists and actual fascists. 
to be able to operate in the mainstream. But I also think that deep down they want they want there to be a radical right wing movement, um, you know, that that's out there so that they can justify recruiting and and their sense of meaning and purpose in life. But yeah, they they are willing to use violence against anyone that they perceive as helping because they believe everything is culture, right? I mean, it is in a way, but they believe that you know even someone saying something that they think is racist by abstraction. Um, you know that doesn't fit the, the 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 mainstream conventional understanding of those terms. They think as enforcing some sort of oppressive society, and they feel justified in assaulting them. I mean, you know what they did to Tony Abbott's sister and and Andrew Bolt. I mean, the principle said the radical left. They don't actually believe in principles. They see everything as a power struggle, right? So politics, and I, and unfortunately, I see this happening more and more on the right too. Politics seems to be um, not about principles anymore, and it's sort of turning into like ideological football, where people are just cheering on their team, and they don't care about any of the rules of the game anymore. Anything's fine, as long as your team's winning. And um, and so yeah, that I mean, but the principle that they're entertaining, like the idea, okay, Andrew Bolt is like an avatar for tens of thousands of Australian citizens, right? Okay, lots of people think like him. Are these radical leftists now saying it's okay to assault anyone with the views of Andrew Bolt? Okay, and then where does that lead us in the future? Okay, th that means that those tens of thousands of people are now justified in attacking any 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 left winger. I mean, it, it's it, it, they're trying what the actions they're doing are trying to degenerate society into some sort of toxic thing where no one can talk to each other anymore and there's no debate and it's just about violence. I mean. You know, after I, you know, went through four years of being an ideologue thinking like this, I spent a lot of time trying to learn about psychology to understand what the fuck what happened to me. And one thing that Cole Young suggested is don't listen to people's alleged motivations, what they say they're doing. Ask yourself, is what they're doing really an excuse for them to be, A, lazy, and then B, malevolent, right? And, and I have to ask myself that about these Antifa people. I mean... What requires more effort, attacking someone or constructing a well-reasoned, well-informed um, uh, piece of debate and speech to articulate a point? What requires more effort? Well, probably, um, you know, the, the writing uh, a position and thinking it out requires more effort than assaulting someone in the street. And what, what's more benevolent or, or malevolent? Trying to debate and reason with someone to try to show them your point of view and, and, and work with them to try and work out what the truth is, or assaulting them. What's more benevolent and malevolent? You know, I think that these people, that there's a, there's a massive malevolence and laziness that runs runs through what they're doing. And it also appears to me that media manipulation is uh, one of their tactics. Uh, always, you know, post these type uh, type of events, and it's uh, it's quite shameful that our mainstream media, you know, uh, basically buys what they say. I mean, because uh, on the news coverage is always like, oh, you know, f uh, you know, right and you know, left wing groups clash when it's you know, it's a you know, right wing rally which the you know, uh, Antifa has come to. Well, I wouldn't use the word counter protest to use the term, try to uh, shut down with violence. And then, you know, they obviously get a lot of press coverage on, you know, talkback stations where they actually, you know, spread, you know, heaps of, you know, misinformation that, you know, oh, the police, you know, uh, assaulted us when we were just, you know, protesting or, the, you know, the I heard one recently that, you know, the police are, you know, uh, so racist against, you know, the, the African community, like, ju like just... Like you, you can tell that it's uh, that it's you know blatant lies. Like first, like are, are, uh, do they uh, you know go in with a plan to manipulate the media, and how do they feel that they're justified in you know, basically spreading these outright lies? Um, well, yeah, I mean it's interesting. I, I would say that they actually kind of believe their own bullshit. They get high on their own supply, so. You know, there are some high-profile cases where Indigenous people were um, died in police custody and, you know, a, a lot of the details of those stories are, are unclear and, you know, maybe the, the, the police uh, neglected their roles in some of them and, you know, um, but, you know, there's obviously... But they take something... They take, like, one thing that, that has happened and then they extrapolate it and make it a universal, right? 
So now all of a sudden it's not just, um, you know, bad policing or potentially bad policing. It's now the police hate Aboriginal people. Do you know what I mean? And, and they, they turn into a universal and, um, and, and I, I think it's, I think it's, uh, I think it's, they kind of believe these narratives that, you know, I mean, okay, so let's break down an example. So at the Milo protest, you know, they went there um, to these sort of immigrant areas where there were like, you know, a lot of sort of uh, ethnic and, and I think Muslim populations. And I think they went there and they hyped up and encouraged, um, you know, those communities to believe that, okay, we need to do this kind of violent protest and throw stuff at the radical right wingers. They're trying to kill you guys. They're trying to kill you. And then, you know, I think their young people sort of reacted or maybe got swept, swept up in the chaos. I mean, I've been in these kind of right situations and it's it's almost like the, the the social forces of what's going on will take over take you over and you know so there were these images of some of these ethnic kids like getting getting involved or whatever and then the police you know maintained a presence and you know had to show force and you know i'm not an expert on policing i don't know if it's the right or wrong thing to do but it's not clear to me by any stretch that the police were involved in some sort of conspiracy to you know attack ethnic communities but, you know, they, they have a presupp... See, the radical left can only see the negative side of society. Everything is predicated on oppression. That's what they see. They believe we're living in some oppressive, white supremacist patriarchy, right? I mean, what, what a garbage premise. I mean, what they do is they build an argument and they look for information that only validates their pre gorn conclusions that we're living in some oppressive society. I could build... But they, they don't build a case to say, to, to, to examine the opposite point of view. So I could actually build an argument to say that Australia is one of the least, one of the least racist societies that have ever existed in the history of the world and on the face of the planet right now, right? We have, it's illegal in any public or private institution to, uh, to disc discriminate based on sex or race, right? You know, if we're living in a white supremacist society, why do we have laws against it? You know, they'll, they'll take, you know, one one example of, of, of some sort of unscientific sort of uh, pseudoscience social study, and then they will go, oh, look, that's proof as that the whole system is corrupt and now we're justified in, ha in hating it and ripping it down. I mean, if we live in an oppressive patriarchy, I mean, Jesus Christ, you know, like, like if men were involved in something, they talk about the men in the same way Nazis talk about the Jews. Do you know what I mean? Like, oh, the Jews are just sitting around gathered in some sort of conspiracy against everyone. You know, like, as if men are just meeting up against everyone or whatever. You know, if men wanted to oppress women in Australian society, we could do it in, in a, you know, in a day, right? <laughs> like, like obviously, that's... See, what happens is the image of the individual gets destroyed, you know, and group identity takes over. Um, in these people's minds, but in terms of the media um, placating to it, I mean, I think, I think people, I think intuitively understand how pathological and dangerous the radical right can be. I think because our societies historically were involved in fighting against, you know, Nazi Germany, and then seeing the atrocities um, that that regime unfolded through their, you know, group narrative stuff. But I, I, I think that people will have less of a consciousness of the atrocities that communist societies have committed, right? I don't think people are fully aware of how brutal um, the Gulag systems were, um, how ridiculous and manufactured that um, the mass starvation was, and that it was a result of, you know, ridiculous um, purgings of, of people who were pr productive in that society that resulted in famines. Um, I, I don't think they, they have any idea how pathological communist societies got because our society wasn't directly involved in fighting it and a lot of the atrocities of communist societies happened internally and domestically rather than happening, um, you know, with, uh, say, the expansion of, you know, Nazi Germany invading other countries. I think that's one of the factors why the media will be more sympathetic to the radical left. Um, and I also feel that as things have descended more and more into a political, um, you know, a, a, into a, a sort of political football game, you know, I, I won't, the, the moderate left-wing people, like people who might work in the ABC, won't look at their crazy radical flank 
because what's more important is beating the other side, right? Rather than following through with principle, you know, and, and that's what I was saying earlier. It's not, it's about power struggle now. It's not about principles and that's fucking dangerous. And, and then the other factor is of course the, um, the proliferal proliferation of, of radical left-wing ideas in university campuses um, through kind of pseudoscience studies like ethnic, um, ethnic and gender studies that basically fall back onto sort of a Marxist and postmodernist um, tools of analysis rather than, um, you know, biology or, or psychology um, as, as, you know, like why isn't biology uh, a, a course in gender studies, you know, because they've got a pre-gone conclusion that, that gender is a social construct because they, you know, it comes from a Marxist idea that, Human nature is determined by the economic forces of history, which I disagree with. Marx was wrong about that. And then, you know, and, and, and then so they, and that's, people want to believe that human nature is infinitely malleable because then we can achieve a utopia, you know. And, uh, and I don't know why anyone ever takes Marx seriously. I mean, the dude, I mean, the dude was writing about the evils of capitalism while, his best mate and collaborator was a capitalist, and he and then Marx was being funded by the surplus value of this factory, and he would like, you know, and I think Marx is is a good story because he he he's kind of like the original vampire of the radical left, and that this was a guy who had illegitimate children, he didn't he wasn't involved in raising, and he was an alcoholic, so he neglected his personal responsibility. But the way he could justify neglecting his personal responsibility is through these radical. Uh, grand narratives of changing the world. Oh, I don't need to worry about that. I'm saving the world, you know, through... And so he... I'm, and yet he's writing a book about the exploitations of capitalism while being funded by a capitalist. Like, could you imagine taking seriously someone who wrote the evils of pedophilia, but his mate was running a pedophilia ring and he was being funded by that pedophilia ring? You know, Marx wrote in his book... Um, I'm not worried about individual capitalists. I'm worried about capitalists as a system. You know, imagine writing, I'm not worried about individual pedophiles. I'm worried about pedophiles as a system, right? You would never take that person seriously. I don't know why Marx is ever taken seriously. So I went on a big rant about Marx, but... Um, yeah, and that's another you know, thing about just... uh, Antifa and these other far left groups is they, you know, preach about, you know, they they care about, you know, the poor and poverty. Yet uh, they all, most of them, come from, you know, privileged uh, backgrounds. They they've never uh, experienced what it's like to be, you know, a, a disadvantaged. And if they, you know, do live in, you know, poverty now, it's mainly by choice. Yeah, absolutely. And I think just like I was talking about Marx, this narrative of like, oh, I'm relating to these grand narratives, um, it abdicates them of any kind of guilt for having unearned privilege. Um, and then they can also abdicate the responsibility. So one of the main leaders of Antifa, Sydney, um, well, the leader pretty much, he, he went to the same private school Tony Abbott went. So, and he grew up like on the North Shore in the rich area. Right. And I think being born with that level of privilege is, is a bit of a burden because like, OK, you've got all the opportunity in life. Now live up to it, kid. You know, go become some, uh, you know, go do something amazing, you know. But instead of that, he can kind of avoid that that fear of failure and that uh, the, the difficult burden of living up to that through these ideological narratives. I also did an interview with a, uh, a, a former ex far leftist, um, Julie who was involved in, um, in sort of the advocacy for refugees. Now, she would actually go teach these refugees English and, you know, help them pay their bills and stuff because they couldn't read and stuff. But she was told by the socialist group that she was part of not to do that and instead to spend her time selling the newspaper for the party because there's no point helping individual refugees because if we achieve the revolution, then the main problem that's causing refugees will be gone. There will be no borders and we'll live in some utopia. And so I actually think that the utopian narrative actually allows people to abdicate their personal... 
Now, as you said, you were in Antifa for four years and you were one of the organisers for it. So you were in uh, quite deep. But uh, how did the process begin? Because obviously, you know, you would have had, you know, very strong convictions during that time. How do you come to, you know, the realisation that everything that you've believed for a long time is wrong? Yeah, well, I, I mean, it was a slow process. I mean, it's a lot easier to learn this ideology than it is to unlearn it, right? And, you know, obviously what happens is your whole social dimension um, becomes, you know, these other radical left-wingers. So it becomes part of your social identity, which makes it harder to kind of change the way you think and see about the world. Plus your social media feed is constantly regurgitating these narratives. And, um, you know, that's something that, if there's any radical right wingers um, listening, I'd like them to maybe think about that themselves. And um, you know, so I was in this echo chamber, and um, yeah, for years and years. And I, I I I saw how cannibalistic and how nasty a lot of these people operated. But that said, there were some really nice, lovely people in this scene. You know, not everyone was an idiot. It's the problem is that the the nice people were so toothless. And so gutless that they could never stand up to the the pathological bullies in the cult, you know, and um, and so kind of I, what happened is I believe that the ideology was fine, and it was just that there were some bad people in the in the movement. There were just some bad eggs, right? And so, you know, I, I kicked around in this ideology, you know, for for a long time, and it was only. After I exposed myself to some critiques of the ideology, I mean, I mean how sort of feminism and uh, you know these narratives of, of white privilege or whatever reduce, reduce people to their group identity, and seeing the way that these uh, narratives would be abused by people, um, and uh, and so I, I sort of started to watch SJW cringe videos. Um, and I, I could start to see how the radical left mirrored the radical right in so many ways. And I I kind of started to make, I made this one video where I kind of tried to redeem and reform, I guess, the radical left. I was, basically my point was, is that the whole PC culture um, is, you know, puritanical and, um, you know, focusing on the trivial rather than the sort of the main objectives and that that was alienating and stopping the, the movement from being able to grow. And, um, you know, I, I made a video called White Male Commits Microaggression. And um, in that video, I kind of, I critiqued this whole notion of white privilege. And I said, yes, on average, historically, white men have had it better. Um, and a lot of it destroys the individual. I mean, you know, and there's other major... Um, uh, measure privilege in, um, you know, and my point was that, you know, a, a lot of the uh, people who attended the Reclaim Australia rally, a lot of them were missing teeth. You know, what about tooth privilege? Um, and so that was sort of a point I made in this video. And so privately with other individuals in the radical left, I would have these conversations with them and they would agree. They would go, yes, it's, it's gone too far. It's puritanical. The identity politics is toxic. So I made this video and then the same individuals that agreed with me in private were publicly denouncing me viciously, viciously for daring to make this video, even though that I was an individual who was still going through court for parking a van to stop the Party for Freedom uh, in Sydney from being able to rally outside of a, a halal food expo. You know, I was going through court, literally, for this cause, and these other individuals weren't. You know, but yet they felt they had the moral superiority to viciously condemn me in public, agree with me in private. Like if they actually cared about me or, 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 or thought that I was wrong, they could have acted with reason. They had my mobile phone number. They could have called me up and go, hey, Shane, I disagree. Let's talk about it. No, they just wanted to savage me. And, um, and you know, this had been happening for a long time and it had happened to others. But that was kind of the last straw where I was like, you know what? You people are fucked. You people are, are, are toxic and you will create a worse society than the one that you think is evil and corrupt and oppressive. And that was sort of the, the final straw for me where I went, 
I'm out. I'm out. This this is nonsense. Of course, uh, changing your political views that's one thing, but then you know leaving an organisation like Antifa, which is you know cult like and which has consumed your life for uh, so long, that's uh, just as hu- uh, just as hard to confront. Yeah, yeah. So a lot of people who have been bullied and, and saw the nonsense in the radical left have chosen to. Um, just put their head down and rebuild their life and just avoid it. Well, you know, I'm, I'm a bit more outspoken and, um, and I think it's, I think it's important for people to speak out against this and to, to fight back against this binary narrative of the fascist evil, anti-fire, um, good. You know, I think, no, everyone's evil, everyone's ignorant, everyone's fucked, you know, and that's the heart of reality. But, yeah, I, I was willing to speak up against them because I think they're wrong. I think they're dangerous. I think that they fuel the radical right. I think their identity politics um, encourages people to become, uh, to try to go, oh, okay, well, we're white then and that's our identity. Okay, we'll play that game then. I think that they've done a lot to encourage um, right-wing identity politics and I think that their, their lack of willingness to debate and their stupid idea that, even giving a platform for someone to say a different opinion contributes to the forces of oppression or whatever is wrong. I think that you have to go back to debating people. And, um, you know, I'll give you an example. Like, years ago, there was a, a, a radical left-winger who's a bit older and more mature. I mean, that's the other factor, is that there's so much immaturity in these movements and, and personality disorders and stuff. But, you know, there's this guy who was a, a uni professor in, in Queensland, and the Australia Defence League, who kind of you know, take the criticisms of Islam, but then I think maybe go too far to the point where they're kind of, you know, maybe a bit unbalanced or whatever. That's my opinion. And then they, he went to one of their rallies and he had a conversation by himself. He went to their rally, had a conversation with them, talked about, you know, his ideas and there was no violence. Um, they were like, okay, we can see your point, you know? Um, and that, you know, maybe you, you there's some truth in what you're saying as much as that, you know, they probably felt there was truth in what they were saying. And then they went, then they left the situation without any violence. And you know what? The Australia Defence League didn't have any rallies after that for years afterwards, right? And I believe that the, the um, combative nature of going to, you know, smash the fascists and trying to fight them is wrong. And I think maybe what... Imagine how much better it would have been when the Reclaim Australia rallies happened if people were trying to engage in debate. And, like, I'll be honest, obviously there are some people who attended the Reclaim Australia rally who have a just as pathological, just as dogmatic, just as maybe evil agenda uh, and that they're on the extreme ends of the radical right and they don't believe in debate and they they want to see society destroyed or whatever because they have the same malevolence in their soul as the radical left-wingers. But they weren't everyone at the Reclaim Australia rallies, you know? Like, uh, imagine if people, people need to... See, the problem is, is the left won't let people have to voice their concerns about Islam. People need to be able to say what they think and then engage in a dialogue rather than going, no, you're a fucking evil racist bigoted for having that opinion and now I'm, I, I have the full reign and, and, and yelling at you and shutting you down and doxing you and, and all this. All that just fuels the whole political divide and it pushes people to the extremes. And I just think, I just think that's toxic and it's wrong. Uh, obviously, like you, uh, you've done our show today. I've also seen you appear on a number of other uh, media channels, and of course, you have your YouTube channel. Has speaking out been hard? Like, uh, which, uh, do you get threats, or uh, sh- should I preface that by saying, like, any credible, you know, threats to to your safety? Yeah, I mean, there's radical left wingers who threaten to attack me, and. Um all the time, and, and uh, there's a lot of slander out there against me. Um, and, you know, they, the radical left try and stop my gigs, because I do, you know, stand-up comedy, and, um, you know, they, they try and ring up venues. But so the thing is, is that because when you're an ideologue, you kind of assume that everyone kind of has your values, almost, or whatever, and you think your ideas are more mainstream than they actually are. Um, and so a lot of the time the promoters, well, all the time the promoters just go, okay, mate, and they hang up, luckily. Um, but, yeah, so they, they do try and attack my livelihood. 
um, and and they do threaten me physically. And um, you know, I will be down in, in Melbourne in the in the thick of it. Um, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if they tried to turn up to my events or or tried to assault me or whatever. But you know, I think anytime they do that, they don't understand that they're, they're actually giving me uh, a bigger platform. And if they ever do assault me, and you know. Um, or whatever that that's going to give me much more attention and mileage because I'm not a right, radical right winger. I mean, you know, I, I, I believe on some policies, you know, I'm kind of right wing. But like, the difference between how I was in the now versus the way I was then is I have uncertainty. I don't know enough to decide what foreign policy should be, what domestic policy should be. I don't know. I don't fucking know. I don't understand enough about economics to to say capitalism is good or, or social democracy is good or anarcho syndicalism is good. I don't know, right? But I do know that th this this power struggle shit, this oppressor oppressed dichotomy, this the group identity stuff is wrong, and that that violence is wrong. Uh, and and I'm I'm and now obviously uh, you st you've started off as a centre-right libertarian, then uh, went into Antifa, which is radically different, and now you're speaking out against them. Are you quite confident now that, you know, you would never uh, be one of those people who would, you know, drift back to uh, Antifa or any other type of uh, radical philosophy? No, because I, I, I feel that now that... I think that politics, politics is an extension of morality. And I think on some level, you know, we all have an existential crisis and we're looking for solutions and, and, and meaning in this life. But I don't think, I don't think the solution is to adopt these, these, these things that aren't even you, these ideologies, you know, I mean, what happens is like, you know, you kind of take one moral principle of, oh, war's wrong or whatever. And then, oh, sex is wrong. And then you just... You, you get so close up into it that you're looking at the world like this, you know. And uh, the, the work that I want to do now is uh, I'm doing a comedy show about addiction and the war on drugs and stuff. And I do think that there's a relationship between morality and not that I think that people with addiction are immoral people or anything like that. But I do think that there's a relationship between morality and our ability to delay instant gratification. So the same, I, I think that the same parts of us that will you know, rationalize drinking too much or, or, you know, eating too much or whatever your addiction might be, gambling or whatever, or, you know, not ev not everyone has these issues. Or even social media could be an addiction, you know. And um, and that, that, that the same mechanisms that make us do that are also the same mechanisms that will make us lie, you know, lie out of convenience, you know, like a common experience that's maybe more subtle would be like a friend who's got food on their face. Maybe you don't want to tell them because you don't want to deal with that conflict and it's easier to lie or whatever. But ultimately, that's the lower moral path, right? Because he's going to embarrass himself. And then you scale up that principle in terms of telling the truth to yourself um, because, you know, you'll justify procrastinating. You'll, you'll lie to yourself. You go, oh, I'm not going to do that project that has meaning and purpose because um, I've got to take out the bins, you know. And, you know, I think a lot of these people will spiritually procrastinate. You know, I think that's what I was doing when I was this political ideologue. Oh, I don't need to worry about um, focusing on my own personal realm or my family life. What about the fucking wars, mate? That's more important. And, you know, you know, to some extension, I know that there's radical right-wingers who, you know, have gone out in Lakemba and, they've, you know, tried, gone into fights with, like, Muslim people, whatever. They've ended up in jail for, like, six months. What, and th th these are people who have kids. You know, and these actions of like these moral narratives of oh, fighting against the the menacing Islamic threat. I mean, that results probably in their kids growing up being on a couch sometime in the future, telling a a doctor, uh, a psychologist, uh, how their dad missed their birthday party because he was fucking running around in Lakemba. You know, and I feel that these political ideologies can kind of allow us to spiritually procrastinate. Just like when I was talking about Karl Marx, um, you know, who was an alcoholic who neglected raising his children, he could justify that in the grand scheme of these great political narratives. So I, I don't, I don't see myself ever wanting to go into becoming a political ideologue, and I have to work out how I can get rid of my own inner corruption and and be a better family member and and to regulate my life better, so I'm less likely to. I mean, I bought a coffee today. 
Do you know what I mean? I mean, this. I know this weakens my cardiovascular system. It wastes my money, money that I could spend doing other things that would make my life more moral and, and bring me closer to my goals and my, my value systems. I mean, what, why the hell should I be telling other people how to live and imposing my value systems on other people when I can't even follow my own value systems? Well, Shane, I've certainly uh, enjoyed hearing your unique insights today and thank you for uh, sharing your experience. Uh, keep speaking out and let's hope Antifa continues to be exposed for the violent, hateful group they are. No worries. Thanks uh, for the opportunity to, to talk to you and your audience. Um, yeah, best of luck. All right, everybody, that's the show for today. Even though 2018 has just begun and the news cycle is still a bit slow, we're still going full steam ahead here at the Unshackled Waves. We have had our 2017 uh, review shows. We'll also be doing a 2018 preview show. And we've also got plenty of uh, interview subjects uh, lined up. So uh, you'll enjoy more uh, stimulating uh, discussions like we had today. And of course, a reminder that voting is open for the annual Unshackler Awards. There are 10 categories with 10 nominees each. So far, the patron Patriot of the Year and Regressive of the Year are available for voting, so make sure that uh, you get on and get voting, and of course the winners are announced on Australia Day. Thanks once again for your company, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net. And keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.